everyone. Um, thank I want to thank everyone for a lot of their work last week um, with the uh, students, with the respective faculty. Uh, it went very well. We put our best foot forward. So thanks to everyone. Uh, today we're delighted to have uh, Warren Miller give our brown bag. Uh, Warren uh, is actually an MD and started in psychiatry, but has been involved in uh, research, particularly on uh, fertility, reproduction, contraception, uh, for many decades now. He's been director of the California branch of the Transnational Family Research Institute, which has uh, in large part been, I guess, NIH supported, among, us, among other things. And uh, the thing where he's doing today is collaborative work, but he's doing a larger book on why we have children building a unified theory of the reproductive mind. So I first met Warren in Vienna a few years ago on a very interesting meeting on fertility preferences, and he presented a great paper combining genetics, uh, answers to survey questions, and fertility intentions. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what he presents today. Thank you for coming up. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let me begin by uh, talking a little bit about my motivation for doing the study. <clears throat> Uh, obviously, all <laughs> reproductive behaviors uh, involve two people, and both partners contribute uh, to the success or failure of their efforts. Uh, so it makes sense to have uh, motivation measures from both people to increase our uh, prediction and understanding of unplanned fertility. Uh, the problem with a couple surveys to, to get this knowledge about both people is that they are uh, prohibitively expensive and uh, complex to run. So it's just not practical on a routine basis. But there is an alternative. Uh, many uh, surveys uh, include questions about the respondents' perceptions of their partner. And um, this, this includes uh, perceptions of their motivations. And uh, I am interested in how valid those perceptions are. That, that's basically what I'm trying to get out of this study. Is, is this a <coughs> useful way to uh, try to get a picture not only of the individual, but of the individual's partner and how, the, how that partner influences uh, fertility outcomes. There are two parts to my presentation. The first part uh, is uh, about an original study that I did with Jennifer Barber, uh, my uh, co-author uh, at the University of Michigan. And, uh, and we looked at ambivalence just of, of the individual herself, in this case, it's, it's the women we're studying. Um, so it, it, that's kind of the foundational study that I begin with. So I'm just going to sketch out some of our findings there. Then I'm going to go into the second part, which looks at uh, the ambivalence, not only of the woman, but of her perceptions of, of her partner and see how those might interact to, to produce uh, effects on behavior. Both studies are framed in terms of ambivalent desires, uh, but as you will see from the model that I introduce a little bit later, um, the, this is a concept of motivation that is really broader than that. It's really based on what I think is an important underlying uh, principle, which is that our, our motivations, our fertility motivations specifically, are motivated by both positive and negative factors. And we have to get at those separately if we, if we can. And uh, to date, they usually have been uh, pursued uh, together with a single question or a single set of questions. Okay. 
Okay, I, I kind of like this uh, cartoon because I think it puts a contemporary spin on the age-old problem of, of unintended uh, fertility. <laughs> so I'll, I won't spell out what, what these names mean, but I assume most of you are familiar with those. No? So, just to talk a little bit about ambivalence. Um, Socrates uh, was, it goes back to, to him, he, he talked about how a, a tragic play can provoke pleasure in the midst of tears. Now that isn't really what we now mean by ambivalence, but it, it, it catches some of the flavor of, of opposing feelings. Uh, Freud took uh, Jean Bleuler's uh, concept of schizophrenia, of uh, ambivalence, which he applied to schizophrenia, and, and wove it in, into his psychoanalytic uh, theory, and he uh, described ambivalence in terms of two opposing feelings about the same person, one feeling of which was typically defensively repressed out of consciousness. Uh, I think our contemporary feeling uh, concept of ambivalence is close to that, but without the kind of psychoanalytic jargon, it's just two strong opposing feelings which interfere with decision-making and behavior. Laurie Zabin was a pioneer in the application of uh, ambivalence to family planning and, and fertility, uh, beginning about two decades ago. Uh, and since her work, there's been a really, uh, especially in the last five years, I would say, there's been a real expansion of uh, studies using the concept of ambivalence. The problem with a lot of this research is that uh, there's no agreed upon definition. They tend to use ad hoc definitions uh, or post hoc uh, definitions based on what's available in the particular database that they're using. It's, it's very rare to find a database that has actually conceptualized ambivalence and, and is, is testing for it. So that's that's what Jennifer Barber and I uh, proposed in a new model. And we hope that this will kind of stimulate more precise uh, definitions and, and, and use in the, uh, in the study of fertility. Okay, this is the figure that illustrates the model uh, or the concept that we're using uh, to define ambivalence. Uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, both positive and negative desires. The, the positive desires run along the left-hand side of the, of the figure and go from uh, very low at one to very high at six, and the negative desires run across the top of the figure from low to high, again, one to six scale. And what that gets you is four quadrants. Uh, the ambivalent quadrant is in the lower right, and that is where respondents who have high positive desires and high negative desires simultaneously, and that's pretty much what we mean by ambivalence. Uh, diagonally in the upper left-hand quadrant is uh, the indifferent group. That's where they have both low positive desires and low negative desires. And in the upper right-hand corner is the antinatal quadrant where the um, the positive desires are low and the negative desires are high, and just the reverse of that for the pronatal uh, quadrant in the lower left. So uh, that's kind of the theoretical justification for uh, putting together 
desires in the way that we do. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So I, I like very much the distinction between indifference and ambivalence, but uh, your two axes are defined as the negative of each other, mm -hmm. and so the, if you put those two concepts together, at least the way you've written them here, they would, it would be the net that would matter, and so the diagonal would all be the same. I mean, it's not as if we have desire to have a child and desire to do something else. We have desire to have a child and desire not to have a child, and those just kind of, you know, one is just the opposite of the other, so they're not different dimensions. They're the same dimension. Yes, so intuitively that's true, but um, you, you, if you, it turns out, empirically, if, if you do design an instrument and you sort of make clear that you're interested both in the, the reasons they might want to have a child and the reasons they might not, that you can get uh, a, a, a dimension of positive desires and a dimension of negative desires. But you're absolutely right. I mean, ordinarily we just think of desires as, as one dimension. And, uh, uh, if you have positive desires, uh, then you don't have negative desires, mm -hmm. they're, they're low. <clears throat> Actually, it turns out that if you look at childbearing motivations, which also can be divided into positive motivations and negative motivations, and that's easier to grasp in intuitively, uh, the, you look at the correlation between the two, and it's, it's not negative as you might expect. It's, it's a zero correlation in this country. It's a little different in other countries, and that's, that's an interesting story in itself. <clears throat> um, so I just want to say about this figure that uh, later on I'll be talking about quadrant-based variables. And, and basically what that means is we're, we're, we're taking, uh, we're making dummy variables from each of these quadrants and uh, using those to predict uh, uh, pregnancy. And you notice that there are four pole cells. Those represent kind of the extreme uh, of, uh, the quadrant, of each quadrant. And um, later we will we will talk about how I divided the antinatal uh, quadrant into the pole cell, people who fell actually in the pole cell, which are the extreme antinatals, and the people who are, are less so. And that's because what we found in, in that first study where we're just looking at ambivalence in the individual uh, was that uh, if you made that separation, you found that there, were, there was a greater risk of pregnancy. It's slight, but it's significant. In the, uh, in the what we call the non-pole cell antinatal group, uh, it was only the, the uh, pole cell antinatal group that had the uh, absence of, of risk, or very low risk. So uh, uh, let's, uh, I'll talk just for a minute about this first ambivalence study with uh, focusing on the respondent herself. Um, in the uh, target population, uh, in, in this uh, sample, the target which was uh, about uh, 900 uh, young women, 18 to 19 years of age and uh, non-pregnant, living in the, in the county, in a single county in, in Michigan. Um, <clears throat> we did a one-hour face-to-face interview, which was followed by a weekly self-report online or in person, uh, in person by telephone. Uh, questionnaires. So this is one of the really interesting key features of the study. Is there, we had weekly data, data collection uh, of their uh, 
desires and a lot of other things, and of uh, pregnancy. The, the measure of desires, I thought I'd read it to you because it, uh, it gives you a little bit of a flavor for what you were asking about. Um, you know, getting pregnant and having a baby is a big event, one that has a lot of consequences. Most people your age have some positive and some negative feelings about getting pregnant and having a child. For this reason, we're going to ask you first about how much you want to get pregnant using the scale uh, from zero to five. Then we're going to ask you how much you want to avoid getting pregnant using a scale from zero to five. So we sort of prime them to think about both the positives and the negatives. This, is, uh, this was Jennifer's uh, scale, and I, I probably would have given more examples to make it easier for the class. <coughs> but uh, regardless, it, it, it worked. In data analysis, we estimated two hazard models to determine the effects of pregnancy desires on the occurrence of pregnancy. Uh, we uh, derived both core variables, which were the, the positive and negative desires themselves, and then the dummy, quadrant-based dummy variables, which I talked about. We used a large number of control variables. Uh, these were largely collected at the uh, n initial interview. And one of the other key features of this study was that we had lag prediction. The preg pregnancy desires used to predict pregnancy were those measured three weeks before the occurrence of the pregnancy. So it's a true prediction here. When we measured the desires, the woman didn't know she was pregnant. She got pregnant as based on a positive pregnancy test. How long was the follow-up? I missed that issue. For how long was the follow-up? You said weekly data prediction for how over what period of time? Uh, the data we're using was 18 months. It's a, yeah, there's a huge amount of data yeah, on these women. Yes. I may have missed it when you read the question out, but um, this is just pregnant in general. Was, was there a time frame of pregnancy? I know in some of the literature on intentions, there's a distinction between this timing and unwanted births. So this, is there a question of the timing of pregnancy when you ask about sort of um, desires? Or is it really just, is, the, is it implicit that it's a short term? Well, these are, these are all young, unmarried, non-pregnant women. Right. And, and so, you know, the presumption is they're, they're not trying to get pregnant or they're, they're not, that they have sexual partners, but they're uh, not, uh, they're not married, so. But you have, in mind that they're, you have in mind that they're reporting on their pregnancy desires as it relates to the short term, not their desire right. to ever be pregnant. Right, yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, so, these are the two core measures, and here we're using them to uh, predict pregnancy. This is the end of this sample of 887. You can see that alone uh, positive desires uh, predict uh, highly significantly, and so do negative desires. You put them together, the uh, significance drops in each somewhat, uh, but the they're both significant, and the uh, negative desires are slightly uh, more important. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the I'm going to skip these. Uh, we looked at differences between, uh, an absolute difference between these two scores. But this table shows the uh, prediction by the dummy variables. Uh, ambivalent dummy, uh, indifferent, pronatal, antinatal, uh, all highly significant. 
the antinatal pole cell dummy, unlike our, uh, our uh, well, in, in just by itself was not significant. Uh, and the antinatal pole cell uh, dummy was highly significant. Notice that this is negative, as you would expect, and it's, as is the antinatal dummy. But the, when you take out the non-pole cell dummy, it's uh, positive. And when you put them all together, the, these three plus the uh, non-pole cell dummy, uh, it becomes positive. And these, are, these three are all highly significant. And, and the uh, statistical summary measures are uh, best of, of the whole. Could you say how to interpret, say, one of these numbers, the 1.35 on an ambivalent dummy, how do we interpret that number? Mm. And that would be the coefficient on the, the desire, the five point, the, the six point desire measure. I'm still not, but this is a model that controls for all kinds of background characteristics, and then we're comparing being in the ambivalent quadrant, versus being anywhere else? Is that what the 1.35 is? No, this, um, let me see. This is, uh, the, the high score on this is predicting the, the pregnancy, and therefore the risk of pregnancy. But the, this is being in the ambivalent quadrant? Is no. that what gets you a dummy? No, the, uh, the uh, dummy variable is a zero one <coughs> variable, so it, the, the uh, ambivalent person it, it is the... Is dummy. more likely to get pregnant. Right. Then, then all three, the, the, the comparison is to the other three quadrants combined, is that the idea? Uh, Everybody is someplace on this quadrant map, every respondent. Yes, that's right. The, um, you, you, but you have um, the antinatal pole cell dummy is not included in this combined. So you have a reference group. I guess I'm just trying to understand why is somebody who's ambivalent or indifferent, why do they have such high scores? These are big numbers. Before we saw numbers like 0.2, now we're seeing numbers like 1 or 1.4. Those were on the scale variables yeah. before, and these are the dummy categories. Mm -hmm. But how can it be as, as, how can the coefficient on ambivalent be as large as the coefficient on pronatal? 1.35 versus 1.49. Well, because it's a different quadrant, that what, what that's saying is that both of those groups are high risk. I guess what you're looking for is they're relative to the, the antinatal group, which is the reference group. Antinatal, the first three coefficients are not statistically different from one another. Yes, that's true. So, uh, and, and and that's one of the things we learned in that study was that, that all three of those quadrants were were as at risk. It wasn't just ambivalence, but the, the indifference and the pronatal are equally at risk relative to the antinatal. Are there a lot of pregnancies in this group? Or are these there were, uh, in the 18 months, there were 126 pregnancies. Out of 900, or is that yeah, uh, 800 times 18 months? That's the week. Well, it's the same as the underlying probability very low. So yes, right. So the underlying probability very low, um, that means that these, that these large coefficients don't change the sort of probabilities very much. They change the right. The odds. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll just.
just quickly talk about this. This is going to be relevant when we get into the next uh, study where we're looking at um, partner perception. The, uh, the, the boxes represent the consciousness of uh, the respondent and of the partner's consciousness. And the, the circles represent the desires of the two people, and this one represents the perception of the, of the partner's desires. The, and of course, there's a, a second uh, di uh, schematic like this, which represents the partner's uh, perception of, of the woman on the left. So I'm not including that in the figure. It gets uh, kind of complicated to deal with couples. Um, the uh, the double-headed arrows uh, represents correspondences between desires. Uh, in this case, uh, this is actual agreement. So the closer together they are, the more agreement. Um, uh, this double-headed arrow is perceived agreement, and. This double-headed arrow is the accuracy of, accuracy of perception. And the, the two uh, single-headed arrows represent uh, attribution, that is to say, the, the woman is attributing uh, heavily to the, her uh, perception of her partner's desires. Uh, and here I use the term apprehend, apprehension. In other words, the, the woman apprehends well the, uh, in her perceptions the partner's desire. And the, the study of Miller and Pasta of about 400 married couples over five years uh, showed that there was a tendency, a strong tendency for the uh, accuracy of, of perception uh, to be bimodal. It, it, so it tended either to be quite accurate or uh, not accurate at all and, and be heavily influenced by the woman's attribution in, in, in this example. Um, these are the, the uh, control uh, variables. I'm, I'm going to skip over these because we're getting already short on time. Uh, these are the, the core measures in this study. Uh, here we have um, the woman's desire to become pregnant and the desire to avoid pregnancy and then her perceptions of her partner. And these are the four of the, the five dummy variables. We've broken the antinatal one into two groups. And the, the five based on the uh, perception of the, of the partner. This is just a, oh, I, I should say, um, we then took the, the five uh, dummy variables of the woman and the five dummy variables of the perceived partner and interacted those in a cross tabulation and so what this is showing is the number of observations and the number of women after the slash who contributed to those observations for these interactions in this case in this cell it's between pronatal and pronatal pronatal and ambivalent uh, pronatal woman and ambivalent uh, perception and, and so forth. Uh, one thing to notice here is that the antinatal, antinatal cell has uh, about 88% of the, the responses. So that talks to your original question that, that you know, you, you get, it's not a lot of uh, separation that you get, but you, it's it's over 
this is the results of the non-interactive <coughs> model. We, we simply took uh, the, the four uh, respondent dummy variables, leaving out the antenatal uh, as a reference, and the, the four perceived dummy variables, and regressed them onto pregnancy. And you can see that there's, there's some, uh, these are all highly significant, the woman's predictors, but the perception of the pronatal partner uh, is also a predictor. So there's, in this particular analysis, um, there is some evidence that <clears throat> there is some meaningful data about the partner that's different from the woman's herself. This is um, the what, what I call the unconstrained interactive model. It, that means that every we we regress every uh, cell except the reference cell onto the uh, the pregnancy and saw how each cell predicted without trying to uh, constrain them in, in any way. Uh, one of the problems with this model is that, uh, as you can see, there are uh, a number of cells where there's non-convergence. And so uh, we're, we're work still working on this, but uh, we have um, come up with a, a, an idea that we could use what's called continuity uh, con uh, correction and uh, get, get those uh, cells to converge. The problem with those cells is there are no pregnancies. It's, it's not the number of cases, but it's, it's, the, it's the pregnancies. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can get around this, and, and that, that's yet to be done. So we, we, uh, okay, so now we have a, a series of, um, of four model families that I'm going to be talking about. Um, <clears throat> I say families because of, this is this is one family. There are a number of variations on this that we looked at, uh, but I'm I'm just going to be showing you the, the kind of the prototype uh, example and the one that had the, the best uh, standing, so to speak. Um, one of the things we did with, well, this, this is called a, the simplest constrained uh, respondent only model. In other words, we, we constrained all of the, these cells into one variable, this, these two columns into two separate variables. This was the reference, and uh, we then predicted with these two. And um, one of the things we did with this particular model, uh, which is uh, basically we're asking uh, whether the, uh, the respondent alone, ignoring her perceptions, is, is a good model, is, a, is a, the best model, uh, ultimately, what, is what we want to know. And uh, the, the, what we did with the reference was we looked at three possible references. One is the one shown here, which is this column. One, it would be just the antinatal by antinatal cell, and one would be both columns. Uh, this is non significant, and uh, uh, just to uh, be quick about it, uh, we ended up since all three of those references were almost identical, um, uh, because this meant one less variable in our model, we, we selected uh, having a model with these uh, two columns as the reference. Uh, 
This is another respondent-oriented uh, model. Uh, these, it's, it's all uh, vertical except for, for this one which is horizontal and that's, uh, so it's uh, the perceived partner is uh, the basis for, for this uh, constrained model. And you can see that all four of those are significant. Uh, this is one that's been constrained to be purely uh, uh, partner, perceived partner oriented. So there's, there's, there are no variables that are constrained according to the respondent herself, all according to her perceived partner. And uh, we, we combined some of these, but we, we looked at models where those were, were separated. And again, we get uh, good prediction. Is there the sense that, some, that any of these are different from each other? So should we read this as suggesting that partners who are ambivalent or indifferent as opposed to pronatal are less likely to lead to oh. pregnancy? Like is 1.74 different from 2.58? Uh, if, if I understand you, you're asking, are those significantly different from each other? Uh, we haven't looked at that. Um, uh, we, we did look at it in, in the next model I'll be showing you, but um, I would guess that uh, this is, is definitely going to be different from these two, just based on uh, what we found in general. Um, I doubt if those two are significant. And this is the fourth model, and uh, I call this the uh, re respondent attribution apprehension model because um, we have this variable which is uh, based on where there is agreement uh, between the respondent and her perceptions of her partner that they are both pro both the same, they, they have the same type of motivation. Uh, and here we have included this one cell uh, because it, it, its characteristics told us it wanted to be in that, uh, in that variable. Um, and then we have uh, the, the, this, high risk group uh, <clears throat> of pronatal ambivalent indifferent, uh, but without agreement on, none of these are, agree on uh, their, uh, on their motivation. And then down here, we have a, uh, a perceived partner being antenatal, which, uh, uh, is oriented towards, towards the partner. Ten, ten minutes? About ten minutes? Yeah, okay. So, um, this turns out to be, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to really justify this, but the constrained um, respondent attribution model turns out to have the best uh, summary measures uh, of, of all of them. Uh, there's, there's some uh, some that have a little better uh, let's see yeah, the log likelihood here is in the non-interactive is a little bit better but when you look at all of these, especially the Aka uh information criterion, uh, this this is the best of all of them. So, uh, just let me summarize um, that the relative size of co efficiency in this previous model, go back, is instructive uh, to 
what's going on. Uh, and here we did we did find that uh, this group is significantly different from both this group and this group. These two groups are not significantly different, but they have a different dynamic going on. This this has the uh, the partner apparently restraining uh, the risk somewhat on the basis of perceived antinatal uh, feel, uh, motivation. And this one has what we believe is an interaction between uh, agreement and uh, accuracy. We, we postulate on the basis of the uh, Miller and Pasta study that there's a subgroup here that is uh, bringing the coefficient of, of this uh, diagonal variable down from the high one uh, on the basis of there being an agreement uh, and an accuracy of perception and an interaction between those two which promotes cooperation and information flow within the couple. And so that's... Hey, just on that last point, is this... Uh, is contraception part of the weight control or is that uh, kind of a pathway that is left to be studied? That's a pathway left to be studied. We did ask one control question, which was based on um, <clears throat> have you ever had sex without intercourse, without, without uh, contraception. But that was asked at the initial <coughs> interview. So what, what they were doing during the 18 months was we're not controlling for that. So along those same lines then, if contraception is, I suppose, one of the pathways, probably the pathway, is the notion that when people agree, maybe there, or when people disagree, there is sort of it's unclear who's taking responsibility for contracepting. Yes. And, and that when they agree, they're, they're sort of, there's either one person taking responsibility or they're both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you control for the type of relationship, whether because at 18, 19 years old, there must be a lot of experimentation, so do you control for the stability of the relationship? Uh, give me an example of, of stability. Well, we think that uh, the perception of the partner's uh, position would be much more determinant to determine the respondent's behavior. If the relationship is stable, then if it's not, a woman might not care whether the guy with whom she's sleeping one time wants a child or not, but she might care a lot if she's in a, a long-term relationship with that person. Uh, I do not see anything that, that controls for... We have to repetition, so... That's one form of yeah. but well, you also have two or more lifetime scanners, but that might not be more. So the same person with different partners could give different answers and could have different yes. outcomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and yeah. Some of the ongoing research, isn't there? Or the surveys we do. <coughs> isn't there any update of who they, whether they have a partner or not? They, they fill out a, uh, a they, they are interviewed either by questionnaire or, or telephone uh, once a week, every week. So if there's any change in, in partners, we, we note that. It's, it's not built into this study, but. So that in this study, for example, they could change partners, their perceptions would possibly change, but the, whether it predicted or not uh, would, would be part of what we're looking at. It, the, the context, as you put it, was these people trying not to get pregnant, uh, but some of them want to have children, some of them are interested in having children now. Uh, how do we, is this, is this population really about Teenagers, or do you think you're learning something about the process of people having children at, at other ages too, where they may actually there may be strong protonatalist feelings among them? No, I think I think the latter is, is true because I, I think you know you could take a two-year age period 
at, at any point, and, and much of the same could be going on. So we're looking at 30 to 32 year olds, the, 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 the coefficients would be different, but you're yeah. saying the pattern would be similar. Exactly. And you could take 32, 30 to 32 year olds who were married and compare them to these or to those that weren't married, you would get different coefficients. In terms of the complexity here, you're interacting, you have an interaction at the individual level between pronatalist and antinatalist, and then you're interacting two people. Uh, it's very complicated, <laughs> obviously. Uh, do you actually, is it showing you something different than if you just have a single dimension for each person, which is what we typically would have? So typically we would have something about fertility desires, one dimension for each person. Could, I mean, theoretically, I assume we could find the same thing, but practically do you not? Do you need both dimensions to get this? Uh, well, that's what we were looking at in a sense in that first model where we just looked at how well the desire is predicted and put them in for the, the, the positive and negative for the, the woman and the and positive and negative for the perceived partner. So we, they're, they're not interacting at that point. They're just uh, each predicting separately. And that model is not as good as the interacted model, which is constrained it, in the particular way that uh, this attribution apprehension model is. Uh, would you describe the target population in your phase two study and whether or not they were interviewed individually or together? No, no. They're, they're, uh, this is only the study of the women. They're not. Oh. We we're just getting the women's perceptions of their partners, so we're not. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, very, it's really interesting, and part of what, what strikes me is that, I'd be interested if you agree with this, but part of what comes out of the work of Paul England and others who have been thinking about pregnancy ambivalence and non viral and teen births is the notion that ambivalence is a big part of the story about why particularly lower SES teens and young unmarried women at birth. It's not that these are desired births, but they're not both, it's, it's ambivalence. And here you do show that ambivalence and even partner disagreement does raise the risk. We also show that most people are not ambivalent. You know, 88% of your cases are in the strongly antenatal yeah. cell, yeah. and 88% of the cases are where both partners in the strongly antenatal cell. So that sounds to me like ambivalence is not an explanation for, you know, fairly high levels of non-marital and seemingly unintended births, because there are very few people who are affected by those increased hazards. Well, 10% are affected. I mean, that's not small, and over time, that accumulates, so it's not minimal. But I think you're right, there's more going on than, than motivation. Okay. Did the weekly diary data um, collect, do you have pregnancy and the desires over time? Because I just wonder about the stability of um, desires and then how that might fluctuate. Yeah, we do have that data, yeah. and uh, Jennifer has uh, begun to look at how, how the patterns of change over time and what they're related to. And uh, I, I can't tell you much more than that. What, what year is this? Is this during the Great Recession by any chance? Or? Uh, when was it? Let's see. Um, it, it, I think it was early in Obama's. So right at the, uh, the onset, 2008, 2009, 2010, yeah, at that time? Yeah. Okay. And is the data already publicly available, or do you have to team up with uh, Jennifer Barber to use it? Yeah, you'd, you'd have to ask her, but she's very generous. I'm sure she works something out. She did present this in a uh, back pop colloquium long ago. <laughs> uh -huh. Maybe maybe it was at a pilot stage before the actual study. I don't know if anyone else was here then. But. Yeah. 
Oh, wait, this thing. Oh, I'm finished.